Uh, good afternoon. I promise it. I try to be very prompt and hopefully finish in less than 25 minutes. I do want to acknowledge two of my colleagues are here, Michael Siegel over there and Kerry Perlson over there. So I'll be glad to answer any questions beyond the panel if we have time later on. So we, went, we have a project going on at MIT looking at a variety of aspects of cybersecurity. What I want to talk to you today is some relatively new work. And the reason I say that is we're looking for feedback from you, because we're coming at it from an academic perspective, which doesn't always reflect reality. So we're looking to see whether we think we're on the, on the right target or not. As you've heard several times today, there is an increasing issue, the focus of cyber risks. There's been examples of attacks on the uh, Turkish pipeline. Uh, the D DHS talks about various attacks. I don't quite know what this means, but the uh, UK claims that they're attacked every minute. And you've all heard various stories about the Ukrainian power grid attack. I won't go into it. The only thing I want to point out, though, was this comment here regarding firmware overwrite. And we want to talk about some of the consequences of that that go beyond what actually happened in the Ukrainian case. <clears throat> so let me tell you, for those of you who, you know, and maybe not just you, but maybe more like your neighbors and friends and your Aunt Sally, who've seen stories about cyber attacks and credit cards stolen and so on, our view is that when you start looking at the cyber physical energy systems, things are quite different and in many ways much more concerning. One is that real physical danger can occur. You know, property can be destroyed, people can be damaged or even killed, if, if you will. And number two, as you've heard a number of times, particularly an example of the Ukrainian power grid, sometimes it's possible to go back to manual control, but some things are so elaborate so complicated that there's no easy way to go back to manual control. One of the things we're seeing increasingly, and once again, a subject to being debated either during the panel or afterward, but we're finding that a lot of the mechanisms that are providing safety or sa fail soft are actually in software. So if the attack is attacking your software, it also can be attacking the preventions you have for such attacks. And so often that's an issue. We'll see examples of it. This is a, a simple analogy, and it's oversimplified, but I have found it, it's something that is useful to bring up. Many of us who have been in the engineering field for a long time have the notion, if you will, of mechanical failure. We understand things do wear out and so on. So if you have, let's say, for example, eight generators at your facility, you know that periodically one may break or may have to be taken down for maintenance and such. But at least you have the other seven chugging along just fine. But if the issue is caused by a cyber attack, it's quite possible that the same cyber attack that caused damage or broke down generator number eight could also break down generators one through seven at the same time. So the notion of independent failure, which is so fundamental to so much we many of us have learned in the past, starts to fall apart when you start looking at it from a uh, attack vector. As you may know, in the case of the Ukrainian case, I think there were three different distribution systems that were shut down. So I'm going to give you a little, and of course, the recovery, of course, can be time consuming. I'm going to briefly mention, uh, I say I would like to get at least closer to the real world. So one thing slightly closer to the real world, MIT itself has a power station, a cogeneration plant that we're working with. And for those who have, who have good eyesight, you can go and read some of, the, some of the fine print here as to what's going on there. But one of the things it has, it has a, a several turbines there. So one of the things I learned in my, in my working with them was the question of what, back to this issue, recovery time. So as it turns out, I happen to hear that at our central facility, one of the turbines failed. It just was not a cyber attack. It was a very simple clogged water nozzle that damaged the turbine. The question was, how long did it take before that turbine was back online? Anybody want to guess how long that took? Or said? Well, a little better, three months. The turbine was made in Germany. Some of the parts had to be remanufactured. The point being here, it's not like the typical IT attack. What you do is you reboot your computer. Or worse, you take it down to the IT shop, they run some cleanware on it, and you're back up and running three or four hours later. Very different world in a case like that. So those are the kind of phenomenons we we're concerned about. Now I'm going to give you just a teeny piece into what we're looking at. I heard several people in the session uh, earlier today talk about the fact that there's a lot has been developed and worked on over the years in the world of safety. And the question is, can we adapt some of those lessons we learned in safety over to the issue of cybersecurity? And so we have an analysis we call cyber safety that we're working on. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I'm going to talk about a little bit of it. And one of the things we do in the cyber safety approach, you start off by saying, what is it you don't want to have happen? So a simple example would be, you don't want the lights to go out. 
I'll give you version two, is you don't want the lights to go out for a long time. And of course, you know, can that happen? Well, I'm not going to comment upon whether it's right or wrong, but you might want to look at the book, book by Ted Koppel on lights out and talking about what could happen. And, and once again, I'm not going to try to defend the various things in the book, but just to point out the issue that people do worry about that, at least to some extent. Now, how many people here are familiar with the Aurora Vulnerability Experiment? Let's see, maybe a little over 30 people. I'm not going to spend much time on it, and people argue whether it could or could not happen in the real world or not, but what it did indicate was that certain types of cyber attacks could cause physical damage to occur. And in, in, in particular, it, as mentioned here, it, it destroyed a generator. So that's the kind of thing that could cause physical damage. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going relatively fast, I'm going to spend a few more minutes, slow down a little bit on the last few slides. So much of what we see in the press, whether it be the more traditional cyber attacks or the more recent ones like the Ukrainian power grid, are the, quote, first of its kind. And that's one of the big challenges, unlike lots of things we've seen in the past, whether they're mechanical or even you know, natural phenomenons of hurricanes, we're in Florida, remember now, uh, that we kind of have, we have some notion about what might happen and so on. There's so many things that have not yet happened yet. How do you plan for the unknown? That's one of the big challenges here. So what we want to do in our research is try to get a little bit ahead of the curve. Things that, as far as we know at least, have not happened yet, but might happen. And, it, and to verify whether it in fact could might happen, and then how do you maybe mitigate that so either it won't happen or you can minimize the damage. So that's, that's why we're kind of stepping out of the safety zone into somewhat more speculative stuff. So the idea we started looking around, see what is a kind of a common issue to look at, and we looked at the issue of a variable speed, uh, variable frequency drives that control often various kinds of pumps and such, because these are used in many, many different types of industrial control in, in, uh, systems, generators, turbines, gas pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. So they're widely used. And turns out, shockingly enough, even at MIT. So if you have a really good eyesight and you can look really, really small down there, you'll see a series, of quite a few actually, of these VFDs scattered throughout MIT. So you say, okay, let's, let's look at what kinds of hazards could be here. And as I mentioned, these are used, but how many people here are familiar with VFDs to some extent? A lot of you. So I'd like to talk, Carrie, get their names. I'd like to talk to a lot of you after to see whether any of the things that we think we see or believe are true or not or what your experiences are. So make sure all those names of hands just went up. So one of the things we wanted to do is, of course, this was in some sense one of the components attacked in Stuxnet. One of the things, we, and once again, at least the ones we're looking at, and I'll come back and say there's lots of different versions of it, many of them have control mechanisms that limit like how fast it can go, but these control mechanisms are part of the software. So it's the software controlling it. Well, if you take control of the software controlling the device, you also take control of the software controlling the limits on the device. Kind of like putting all your eggs or more of your eggs in one basket. One other thing, of course, in most of these VFDs often make use of large capacitors to store energy, if you will. So here's an example. Uh, this is about the size of, I, I guess they call it a bread box, but I don't know if anybody knows what a bread box is nowadays, but a relatively small kit that he used in some of the labs at MIT for students doing experiments on various types of, of devices and such. You may have similar things in your own for test facilities. If you go and kind of pry the box open, oh, by the way, you notice back there is a series of capacitors. And one of the problems we're having, having said we haven't found a good authority on it, is how to translate this into something tangible. And, and uh, doing some rough back of the envelope calculation, we decided that if you cause those capacitors to essentially explode, they would be equivalent to about seven firecrackers. It may blow your finger off or something, but not too, too bad, okay? What we found out, for example, was that obviously in, in, in here, of course, there is a microprocessor that's controlling the VFD, if you will. And the good news is, of course, like many things we have, we have automation. It gives you much more flexibility, allows you to do lots of exciting and new things. But of course, the not so good news is they then become a cyber target. Now, we're not going to talk, and this came up in the previous speaker, about all the various perimeter things you could try to do to prevent people from getting access to your software. But as we saw in the Ukrainian case, they did get access to the firmware. So we're kind of putting that off to the side. We have ideas how that might have happened at MIT, or could happen at MIT, but let's assume that it could happen. We said, let's assume you have access to it. We found that by fiddling with, I think, put the number here, I think it was six lines of code, we took control of it. We took not control of it, we also disabled its security devices or safety devices. 
Okay, what did that do? Well, I actually have a video, but I don't have time for it, and also the file was so big I couldn't send it to you, uh, Sid. But you see here, it caused basically the, the it, this all happened in less than 60 seconds. So it's not something you say, oh, pull the cord. Well, by the time you finish saying pull the cord, it's already too late. So this was a simple example in this simple test kit. Now, put things in perspective. There's the student test kit we talked about. Uh, this is the piece of the diagram I showed you of the MIT co-generation facility. And this happened to be the one that deals with the ch uh, chilled water part of it with a 400 horsepower pump. And, and this is the size of it. Okay, there's the test kit, there's the actual unit. Now, one of the things we're working on, and this is once again where I appreciate some feedback from you, is if we were to do with that unit, by the way, we actually found a surplus one they've given away, so they've given us one, a little smaller than this one. We haven't turned it loose yet. We're trying to figure a spot we can do it with and worrying about the neighbors, if you will. But the idea being is if, for example, the same thing we did with that little test kit, someone were to do with this guy over here, what would happen? And just on the, on the back of an envelope calculation, we came up with the equivalent of being maybe 168,000 firecrackers. I, I don't know what that corresponds to in TNT and so on. We're not sure if the calculation is right, but obviously it could be more significant. And so the question is, well, can, can these things happen? Well, as I said, to the best of my knowledge, there's not been a cyber attack, but you know, a lot of these things that, are, that could be cyber attacks often occur just by other accidents that can occur. And there were similar things that occurred on the Queen Mary II where a capacitor bank exploded. This is a bent steel door. So, so when these things go off, they mm, have a bit of a kick to them, as it were. So we're looking at the issue of are these potential cyber targets with cyber risks, and if so, what could be done to mitigate those? That's kind of trying to get ahead of the curve rather than after the fact, so, oh gee was I wish I had looked at that before. So in our own work, we're looking both at MIT and elsewhere to could this even happen? What would be the impact of this happening? And what could you do about it? So I'm not sure if I did my 25 minutes or less, Sid, but just so you know, we're looking forward, to, and I'm glad I saw so many hands go up, this is kind of some preliminary research we're involved in. We're very much interested in hearing your own experience about this, either in terms of, as I said, accidental failures that could have been cyber failures and what the consequences were, and looking at kind of how big the damage was, and of course, more importantly, what can we do to mitigate these and other such not yet first events? How do we make them never events, or at least be ahead of the curve when they do occur? Thank you very much for your patience and hearing what we're talking about. Looking forward to talking more to you today and the rest of the meeting this week. Thank you.